Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, the creator and host of the award-winning podcast that you're listening to right now, thank you so much, called Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. It is a daily podcast, 365 days a year, and each day we talk to an author about all of the things related to their career, their book, their life, and more in 30 minutes or less, because who has time? I am now an author myself, although I wasn't when I started this podcast, and you can get my new memoir, Bookends, a memoir of love, loss, and literature, wherever books are sold starting July 1st, and my children's book, Princess Charming. You can learn more about me at zibbyowens.com, but really, you're here to learn more about the authors, and that is what we're going to do. Also, be sure to check out all the other podcasts in the Zcast Podcast Network. You can learn more at zcastnetwork.com. Dot com and definitely check out those shows as well. Today is a special week for Zivi Books because we have announced our spring season of books launching in 2023 and are releasing one cover each day for this week of September 19th on at Zibby Books on Instagram. So check it out and follow along and see what our first books coming out starting in February 2023 are all about on Zibby Books. And while you're at it, check out the new Zibby Mag, zibbymag.com, which we launched last week and is the new literary lifestyle destination. Check it out. Today's episode features author Linda Leugman, and I'll tell you about her in a second, but this is one of the first that I'm releasing that is guest hosted by a very special guest host. I realized this fall that I had committed to way more interviews than I could humanly manage, and so I drew on the goodwill of a couple fellow authors and podcasters to help me. This episode is guest hosted by Alison Pataki, who is a best-selling author in her own right and has written The Magnificent Lives of Marjorie Post, The Queen's Fortune, The Accident. Accidental Empress, and many other books, including a memoir, Beauty in the Broken Places. So she is interviewing Linda Leugman, and now I'll tell you about Linda. Linda Leugman is the author of The Matchmaker's Gift, a novel. She has received a BA in English and American Literature from Harvard College and a JD from Columbia Law School. Her debut novel, The Two Family House, was a USA Today bestseller and a nominee for Goodreads 2016 Choice Awards in Historical Fiction. Her second novel, The Wartime Sisters, was selected as a Woman's World Book Club pick and a Best Book of 2019 by Real Simple Magazine. She was also on this podcast if you want to go back and listen to her first episode about the Wartime Sisters when I interviewed her myself. The Matchmaker's Gift is her third novel, and according to Publishers Weekly, readers are in for a treat. Thank you to Alison Bataki for guest hosting this episode. Hi there, I'm Alison Bataki, and I am joined now by Linda Cohen Leugman, author of the beautiful new book, The Matchmaker's Gift. Linda, thank you so much for joining today. Thank you, me. I'm today, Allison. Hi there. Welcome, welcome. So this is your third book. It is a beautiful book. It is a gift. It's being called a gem for readers. Will you just start with telling us the how and the why behind this book and how you came to write it? Absolutely. So like so many books that are coming out this year, this book was written during the pandemic. Of March of 2020, my daughter was sent home from school because she was a junior in college and she actually brought home a really just added so much to our household. She was really such a blessing for our whole family because families were a lot in the pandemic. She was sort of our buffer. (laughs) She brought all of us together and it was a really wonderful experience having her. Having her and my daughter home added to the female energy of the house. We were talking about what the young women at the table were studying in college because they were in the middle of their college about different issues that they were facing in school, issues that they were concerned about, you know, entering the working world. And at the same time, we were binge watching a show called Indian Matchmaking (laughs) on TV, on Netflix. And my daughter's roommate said, you know, my grandmother used to be an Orthodox Jewish matchmaker. And there was actually a New York Times article. When she told me that, something just sort of clicked in my head. And I thought, you know, wouldn't it be nice to write a a sort of lighter story about women and about a matchmaker and her granddaughter? But, you know, this sort of inspiration came from that. And that was, those were the first seeds of the story. As there were a lot of that had to be made, and tone and era and all of that. But that was, that was the beginning of it. What was her reaction when you asked her, how did she feel about that? She was excited about it. You know, I said, I'm kind of thinking this would be a great story. What if we said, write it? <laughs> like she was just, she was excited. You know, she was a philosophy major. So that's amazing. And she's just, 
she's a great thinker, you know, and so just being creative with them. So I think she was really excited about that. What an exciting pandemic quarantine for her. She comes home with her friend and then her friend's mother is this beloved author who ends up writing a book about her, inspired by her, inspired by her. So my daughter was home with her boyfriend and with her roommate, with Adele. So it was, you know, the three of them all came to visit. She's like our bonus child. You know, she's like our bonus daughter. So it's very special. And I dedicated the book to two of them, yes. to the two young women. Because they were, it was just, they really made the pandemic special for all of us. So it's I'll it's say fun. so. For all of us, for all your readers who get the book as a result, this unexpected windfall oh, of your quarantine. <laughs> you're very sweet. So, so good. So, so how early in the process did you let Adele read the book then, or a draft of the book? Or has she read it yet? Yeah, she actually, so... Adele is fluent in Yiddish. So she had the Yiddish knowledge. So she helped with phrases. And and she comes from a religious home. So she was able to help me with a lot of different, you know, a lot of different tips. Although I had so many people helping me with research. That was one of the really nice things about this book. You know, someone even from my law school to tell me that her PhD thesis had some relevant things about it because she was writing about marriage and divorce in the 1800s. It's like people sort of chipped in from a lot of different places to offer me their insight, like a community effort in certain ways, which was really nice. Oh, it was the book that you were meant to write in this moment that was meant to be written by you. That's so beautiful. Yeah, I feel that way. I feel like you know, my other two books were much more dark, but they were much more serious. And this book has a joy to it. And it seems very strange to say I wrote my most joyful, most dark of our sort of collective shared history with the pandemic with so many people suffering. But I did find that like people have responded to that now because now that we're coming out of that, people, I think, some light yeah. and searching for some joy. So that makes me feel good. Yeah, because it's full of love and it's full of relationships and family dynamics. And one thing, Linda, I will say that you so clearly poured into this book and that you have such a gift for, I find that you are sort of on your own level when it comes to this is character development and just world building with your characters. Linda, they jump off the page. You just imbue them with such life and spirit and individuality. And as you said, this in particular is sort of a grandmother, (laughs) a grandmother, granddaughter tale. But can you talk about how you build your characters and how you build your world worlds? Because you just make them such a rich experience for the reader. Sure. Thank you. That's so nice coming from you because I admire everything that you do with your character. For me, I really... I'm a very slow writer. This book was actually the the fastest I've ever written a book. You know, I knit characters for a long time and I need to really get to know them Mm -hmm. and that makes them real. So I know some people have sort of exercises they do. You know, if you take a writing class, they'll say, write it from your to their mother or whatever, whatever kinds of things. I don't do things like that, but I especially with this night, I sort of say goodnight to my husband and then I turn on my side and I think about my characters and I fall asleep about them when I'm in it. I mean, not all the time, but when I'm really in the middle of drafting and I'm really in the middle of developing who they are, that's what happens. You think about them all day long because, you know, we all have lives and things that we have to do, but I do I go to sleep sort of quite time and I stay up for a while kind of thinking about them. And I'm, it's a constant, what if, you know, what would they do in this situation? And what if this, and just really sink into them. So I think maybe that's part of it. They're really in my, and I guess I probably dream about them, even though I don't remember those dreams, but they're, they're the last thing I think about, you know, before I go to sleep when I'm, yeah. especially with this book, it's because we we're stuck it. There's no go, and there was no other stimulation, really, right? Like yeah. it wasn't like you had those stimulating, I don't know, anecdotal moments with strangers that we all sort of craved during the pandemic, right? Like just seeing street thing, or just saying something to somebody at the grocery store, or a little small act of kindness of holding a door open for someone. All those things that make us 
part of the community were lacking. And so my community, especially at that time, were these characters in my head. And I was having my little interactions with them. Yeah. And you lived with them and they became a part of the fabric of your subconscious. And maybe that's why they feel so deep and rich with their own flesh and subconscious identities as well. Well, you did an amazing job. One of the things you joke about in your author's note, but also that the characters in your book talk about is that for a lot of us, the primary and only concept we have of a matchmaker is this Yenta sort of inspired by Fiddler on the Roof. And then your character is, your characters are talking about sort of a very different take on this matchmaker. Can you talk a little bit about how you sort of dealt with that as well and how you flushed it out for your characters, Sarah and Abby with the book? Yeah. So, so as I was saying, you know, when the girls came home, we were talking about women's issues. That was in head a lot when I was writing this book. So, which sounds strange, but it was, it's, it's sort of like a, there, there was that whole other layer that I was thinking about when I was writing it. So yes, it's a story about a matchmaker and yes, it's a story about love and finding love and soulmates. But there's whole this, this layer that I feel like is really relevant to working women today because here is this young woman and she is, you know, the book starts in nine and she's 10 years old. And what I found during my research was that there were like, hundreds and hundreds of in the city then and in the on the Lower East Side just alone hundreds and hundreds and this was like according to the New York Times and other sources part of the New York Times which you wouldn't think would be writing about Lower East Side immigrant matchmakers but they were mm-hmm. so when I was researching and when I was trying to decide what era the grandmother would live in and what era the granddaughter would live in it's I, I had thought in the fees you know it was going to be like a Mrs. Maisel sort of vibe right mm-hmm. but when I started researching and I found found this earlier era, it all became rich and so fascinating to me. So at that time, most of the matchmakers were men. They weren't only men. They, women were allowed to do it. So uh, these, mod- these religious modesty rules. Mm-hmm. And I talked to modern day matchmakers too. And it still is the case because you're not allowed to be a matchmaker if you're not married. You don't know about marriage. Mm-hmm. And there's also this modesty of hanging out with, you know, an unmarried woman hanging out with an unmarried man. Like what could happen, right? Mm-hmm. So you can't be an unmarried man. So that was something that was fascinating to me because of course, if I have this young woman doing this who isn't married and maybe doesn't even want to be married. And then I also found not in the U S but I found an article about a matchmakers union in Poland. So of course in mind, then if there's a match, you know, it's fiction, I can sort of create this cabal of matchmaking men, right. On the Lower East side who are going to be very annoyed that this young woman who is unmarried is flouting, you know, flying in the face of their tradition because she's making these love matches and she's going to have to fight against all of that. So that's the feminist sort of, which I do think is completely different from the Yenta, from the Fiddler on the Roof, from all of that. You know, it's a very, very different vibe as from those sort of traditional matchmaking tropes that you think about. Yeah. And that we all think about probably. So what, what is your process yeah. like? And, you know, if such a thing exists, what is your typical day like as a writer? What, what does it sort of look like behind, behind the veil in the life of, of Linda, the author? It really really depends where I am with a book, as I'm sure it does for you. You know, like there are days I try to write and when I say write every day, it doesn't always mean sitting and writing. Sometimes it's just outlining or researching or thinking, you know, just sitting and kind of thinking and figuring out a plot point, just sitting with my story. But I find that if I'm away from a story for too long, it takes me to reinsert myself. So I, I don't really like too many days to go by without having a touch point, having a connection to the word, because then I get a little bit lost. So I like to be in it as long as much as I can. With The Matchmaker, I wrote it from like September to April, and then it was done. And so that was just crazy fast. But again, you know, we were trapped at home. I wasn't going anywhere. So it came quickly. But I, you know, my kids are older. So I have time. I, you know, you have young children mm-hmm. physically are exhausting. I have older children. You know, it's a very different thing. I have a lot more time in my day. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So then are you looking forward to sort of in the post pandemic sort of ish era, you're going to be able to go out and be with readers and do in-person events and actually like, yeah, I'm so, yeah, 
I am so excited about that. Yeah. I have a real mix of virtual events and in person. So I think, but I am so excited to, to talk to readers and to be in person. There's an energy that comes back that you can't get on the screen. Absolutely. As you know, you know, you just had your book come out. And so, you know, that it's special to be able to send a book for someone and hand it to them. You know, that's a special connection that you have. And virtual events have been gotten us through. And I do think that there will always be a place for them now because so many people can't leave their home or they're far away and and get to, you know, touch a reader's hand, you know, just be, be with people. Yeah. Yeah. So Linda, there's, there's some magic in this book. I I mean, you're writing, but also in the way the book sort of takes shape and for the characters. (laughs) And I loved how you handled that because it was so beautiful and so delicate. Can you talk a little bit about that and sort of the suspension of disbelief that uh, you're taking readers on this journey and how you decided to deal with the magic of what the matchmaker's gift actually is? Sure. That's such a good question. I have always loved books with a touch of magic. Alice Hoffman is a huge Alice Hoffman fan. I love sort of... I don't even know what you would categorize. I guess historical fantasy, which was just a fantastic history, you know, so much rich history, but then you add in a magical element. And so I've never, I had never done it before. And I was nervous about it, about how, even about how my editor, my publisher might receive it because, you know, changing still historical fiction but adding that element was something really new for me and but it just felt I just knew immediately what it would be I knew what it would look like struggled with how to describe it properly that was probably the part of the story that you know you have a day where you write a thousand words or two thousand words you have a day where you write a sentence and so those were the days when I was writing sentences when I was sitting and staring at my screen and writing a sentence and coming away and just coming back and deleting writing the sentence, you know, Mm -hmm. trying to figure out, because in my head I could see it, Mm -hmm. but I couldn't, it took a lot for me to describe it in a way and happy with where I felt like somebody else could see it. So that, that was a painstaking process, but I, I just love, I just love a good old fast story. Oh, you so succeeded. You succeeded. <laughs> it might have taken Thanks. you days to get <laughs> the sentences down, but you nailed it. How did your editor feel? How how did the publisher's response come across? She was really happy with it, I think. Yeah, yeah. she was really happy. With it. When I read her editorial letter, I cried. <laughs> I just she wrote an editorial letter, you know, when she when I sent her the draft. And she's she's so smart there can at St. Martin's and she's so smart. And she's so, she's just so in touch with words. And she's such a lover of words, which I appreciate so much. And she just wrote a very beautiful editorial letter. And I just cried. felt so sin. You know, that feeling of really feeling like someone understands what you're trying to do with your words is just, I mean, there's nothing more satisfying than that as a writer to yeah. feel that. So that's how I felt when I read that letter. I'm up now thinking about it. Like I just, it was such a great day. Like, you know, I mean, when you, when you set out to the, when it's a book, you don't really know when you start what you're setting out to accomplish. Right. And, mm-hmm. and then as you write it, you, you come up with your themes and you layer, you come up with what it is that you really want. What do you, what, what are you really driving at? And when someone sees that and, writes you a letter to Mm -hmm. say, I saw what you did here. It's so special. So you and she are a perfect match then to use your book as inspiration. (laughs) It sounds like. She just, she really, yeah, that was special. Great. So what, what's something you find challenging about the whole publishing process as a writer? One thing. Well, (laughs) I think, yeah, I have a really, you know, you never, you know, this too, as a writer, you want to build readers. You want to build your, just your, your writing life. You know, you want to expand it. 
you want to relapse. But sometimes to do that, you have to stay in one lane. And staying in one lane is really hard for me. Mm. It's very difficult. Like this story, you know, it's his story. But like, eh, I went a little bit, you know, into magical realism. And I have, I'm constantly getting I out of thoughts, too many thoughts. And I have so many thoughts for stories. And sort of when I signed up or when I come for this book, I, I had another book that I was working on too. And I thought that would be the, the fourth book. But then I realized that fourth book, that's not a good fourth book to follow. And I want to do this kind of thing again. I want to have a little bit of a touch of magical realism again. So it's kind of, you're always sort of shifting slightly, or I am always shifting slightly and trying to keep my focus on something that is going to be satisfying to readers for the next, you know? And so you can't, I mean, I guess I could like, like get on regular. I just wouldn't. I, 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 you have to sort of slowly figure out what direction you're going in. So that is challenging for me to keep myself on track and to find the book that's the right book to follow each book. Mm-hmm. So, how much so, can you how much can you tell us about what's coming next? <laughs> oh, uh, the next book is really. It's very fun. I think if people like The Matchmaker's Gift, they will like the next book. It's inspired by my husband's great-grandmother, who was a pharmacist. She graduated from pharmacy school in 1920, which is so cool to think about a woman doing that. So it it's a young female pharmacist, and there may or may not be some magical chicken soup. <laughs> there, there, you know, there's a little bit of, yeah, it's sort of a, her father's a pharmacist, her great and more of, you know, sort of old world remedies for things that, you know, so it's sort of the struggle between that. And it's, it's a very, it's a really fun story. It's also historical. This one is going to take me back to Brooklyn. So Love where my it. first book was since I left Brooklyn. So yeah. Oh, the, and that yeah, first book. It's going to be so beautiful. So beautiful. It was you who told me that chicken noodle soup when you're sick is called Jewish penicillin, right? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was thinking about that. And that idea of listen, just, I don't know. I've always heard the stories of my husband's great grandmother. She actually, she practiced like well into her, he's docking her certificates mm-hmm. <laughs> so that it looked like she was younger than she was. So that element is kind of in my story too, because that seems slightly dangerous, but you know, I guess she got away with it. Amazing. <laughs> so funny Love kind it. Of thing. But I, named, I named the main character. Her name was Lista, but people called her Goldie. And so the, the character in the story has the same name, which is really nice. We will look forward to that, Linda. What piece of advice would you give to an aspiring writer? Oh, writing. Really, you really have to just keep writing. I mean, you can't stop and you can't quit. When I, I was for Sarah Lawrence College in the Writers Institute, and one of the things that it was more like a workshop than really in the pages and sat around the table and read it to each other. And one of the things that the professor would say, or someone, I'm pretty sure he said it, the difference between a published author and just someone who writes for their own enjoyment is just that you, just that you don't give keep and you keep trying and you keep submitting and submitting and trying. There are so many stories of so many people had so rejections, you know, and then one day something hits and somebody sees what they're doing. My editor saw that she really saw what I was trying to do. You just hope that there will be someone who will see what you are trying to do and appreciate it. It's just sort of fun. Absolutely. Absolutely. What is one thing that you want readers to take away from this book or to take away from speaking with them now, you know, what is something that you really feel like you're putting out into the world with this book and with these characters? There's a lot of joy. You know, there, there is a lot of joy. I hope people feel that when they go away. There's also just this sense of, of tradition, of passing something on, of feeling connected to the past and connected to people in our past and the gifts, no matter what they are, you know, the gift in this book is a literal, a literal talent. The idea that there are so many gifts that those and, you know, that our ancestors, that especially our grandmothers, our female ancestors ask to us, whether, you know, whatever they might be, whatever traits, whatever 
what words of wisdom, whatever lessons that they've given us, which sort of old things and to connect to them. But I think, I think the joy is really a big part of it. And just, it, it's sort of the same way when I say that the whole sort of feminist loss line of, of Sarah's career and what she endures very relevant to today. So too are just all of, the, I, I think that's something that people who said of the past is so relevant. It's always relevant. What our grandmothers, what our, what the people before us went through. So it's that sort of tapestry that, that I, I hope people kind of walk away with. So beautifully said, not surprisingly, coming from you, <laughs> Linda cohen Leugman, yeah. author of The Matchmaker's Gift. And speaking of connection, how can readers connect with you? Can you share your website and your social media and anything we should know about? Sure, um, yeah. How to find yeah. you? I'm, I'm all over the place. Yeah, <laughs> I'm all over the place. I get that. That's just my full name.com, Linda cohen I'm on Instagram. Leugman is a really strange, if you just like... Google Leugman, find me, every, you know, because there aren't very many Leugmans. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. Linda C. Leugman, I think, is the slightly different. Leugman on Instagram and on Facebook. It's Linda Leugman, Linda Cohen Leugman author. And I'd love to please follow me and I'll be announcing all the different events, virtual and in person. Amazing. Amazing. Well, the book, again, is The Matchmaker's Gift by Linda cohen Leugman. Such a beautiful book being called A Gem by Kate Quinn. Really, it is. It's a gift to readers. As you said, it's just a beautiful, joyful, magical, historic experience of family and love and life and womanhood and friendship. And thank you so much for giving it to us all to enjoy and savor, Linda. And congratulations again. Thank you, Allison. Thank you so much for speaking with me and being such a thoughtful reader and thoughtful asker. I so appreciate it. It is I who thanks you. So thank you, Linda. The Matchmaker's Gift, a beautiful book. And we know this will be one that readers will be savoring until the next one comes along, Linda. <laughs> thanks again. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music.